My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hello there. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the David Summerfleck podcast. My guest today is Dr. Marsha Ledford. Did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, the Reverend Doctor. But Reverend Doctor, thank you. Just call me Marsha. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Marsha, let's start with introductions and overviews, if that's okay with you. Sure. Can you please start with your background, your education, your experience, and how you came to be adept in so many different realms? Because that's what really got my interest at first and made me want to talk with you, you know, as an interviewee on my podcast. So can you start off with your background, education, experience, and just how you came to be a civil rights attorney, a minister, and political activist, if that's fair? Uh, I'd be delighted to do that. Uh, I'm from Michigan. I was born in Detroit. My dad worked for GM, so I like to say that I was made in Detroit. Uh, and I went to Albion College, which is a small liberal arts college between uh, Ann Arbor and Chicago. I studied American history and psychology because I wanted to go to a law school, go to law school. Uh, prior to that, say when I was 14 or 15, I sensed a call to ordain ministry, but I was not seeing women at the pulpit and at the altar when I was that age. So I decided to go to law school and do the kind of law that helps the marginalized. And so I became a civil rights attorney and uh, developed a real love for our constitution. So I did that for many, many years in private practice. And uh, two of the major focuses of my work as an attorney were LGBTQ civil rights, back in the day when it wasn't terribly cool, and criminal defense work. So that was what I did. I kept poking back that sense of call to ordain ministry. And ultimately I learned that uh, if the Holy Spirit is gonna uh, put you somewhere, you're gonna go whether you realize it or not eventually uh, you're going to lose your battle, just like Jonah did, who got swallowed by a whale when he was trying to run away from God and then got spit out on a beach. So I kind of felt like in my mid-40s, I got spit out on a beach. And so then I pursued seminary work for a Master of Divinity degree, and I started a uh, Master of Divinity degree, and I started in Detroit at the Ecumenical Theological Seminary. And I'm really glad I did that because we spent a lot of time studying urban ministry, which is my primary interest, and theologies from around the world, Asian theology, African mm. theology, womanist theology, which is African-American women's theology in the United States, feminist theology, which is white women's theology. So uh, that was a great experience, but because I was pursuing ordination in the Episcopal Church, I had to do some Anglican studies because the Episcopal Church is part mm. of the Anglican communion, the, the global Anglican communion stemming from the Church of England. So I went to the Church Divinity School of the Pacific in Berkeley, California to finish my Master of Divinity, and then I did Latino ministry in Detroit. All of my experiences as a civil rights attorney, as a criminal defense attorney, uh, did not prepare me for how appalled I was at how our immigration laws are affecting Latino families. 
not just in Southwest Detroit, of course, but around our country. And so I discerned that perhaps parish ministry, congregational ministry wasn't quite where I needed to be. Uh, I needed to be advocating for greater social justice and helping to equip the faithful to do that. So then I went to the Pacific School of Religion and, and studied for a doctor of ministry in political theology. Uh, PSR and the Church Divinity School of the Pacific are part of the Graduate Theological Union, uh, which is a, a really fabulous interfaith consortium. So uh, that was important to me because uh, in Southeast Michigan, we have the largest population of Muslims and Arabs in the world mm. outside of the Middle East. And we have a very large and active Jewish community. So the Abrahamic faiths are well represented here as well as many other Asian uh, religions. And so it was important for me to have an interfaith study. Then I started Political Theology Matters, which is the for-profit business that I use. And I mention that because I did not want the restraints that would be on me as a 501c3 tax exempt entity like churches are. I didn't want to have uh, my speech and uh, activities to be limited by that by the IRS code. So Political Theology Matters helps me get the word out by speaking, teaching, and pre preaching, uh, selling my book, which is upcoming later this year, uh, to help folks learn how to do this. Okay. What would, what motivates you to be so active in a daily manner with these different roles? And then secondly, how do you balance those those roles and getting the most, you know, pr productively. Mm -hmm. uh, is that balance even necessary or do you just go at everything? It, you know, do you just throw rice at the wall, kind of, so to speak? You know, I'm just going to wake up and see. I mean, how do you do all of that? Well, I think those who know me well would say, well, Ledford just goes at it. Um, I Finding balance Finding balance has not been really that hard because uh, my wife of almost 40 years next year, and I don't have children, um, our work has sort of been our children, and she is very, her, her work, her profession is about civil rights as well. So mm. we have that very important common denominator between the two of us that helps us both uh, stay balanced and keep each other in check, so to speak. And, you know, when it starts getting to you, we, we help each other out. And I think that's been critical for both of us in our work. Yeah. Um, and obviously, um, as a lesbian coming out in the early eighties, we had uh, a very challenging experience with all of that. There was a lot of homophobia then. There's still homophobia now, but I would say that it's different. And we had to f manage coming out to our parents and coming out to people that we loved and didn't want to lose. So there's, the, there's this concept in Christianity called the wounded healer. Have you heard of that? It was no, a, I have not. It's a, a phrase that was uh, taken from a book by Henry now and a great a uh, spiritual mystic in our tradition, a uh, Catholic priest. And he talks about how we take that woundedness that we experience and we turn it to the good by helping others who are going mm. through something similar. So I would say predominantly the thing that drives me the most is that sense of being wounded uh, by, you know, being treated the way I have been simply for being myself. Yeah. Um, and learning to overcome that and learning how to channel that into other areas like racial reconciliation, like in immigration reform, which is a form of racism, you know. Um, and so that's, I think, how it works. So it reinforces your daily motivation. Yeah. But but also your relationship also reinforces that as well. Absolutely. And that, that I mean, definitely we were, helps. Uh, together, uh, all, 30, 33 years, I think, before we were able to actually legally marry. Yeah. Um, uh, so, well, let me um, ask you my next question here. 
where does integrity start where and i'm talking not, not about you personally but as far as us as individuals where does integrity begin where you are informed and hopefully actively engaged but then a culture of resistance to oppression begin how do we encourage and facilitate greater involvement in civic engagement when so many people are really struggling paycheck to paycheck in a society that seems to divide almost purposefully. Mm -hmm. Is that too much of a big question to unpack? Yeah, as well? why don't you break that into a couple of pieces? <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's start with the integrity question. Okay. So, I mean, how, as an individual, how do you practice integrity and be informed and actively engaged if we're living in a society in which is just very, very difficult? And then the next right. part of that is, you know, encouraging and facilitating that where we're struggling, you know, to get by. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for me and for many, um, growing up in a tradition that teaches the value of each and every person is really critical. That could be Catholic social teaching, which uh, most Catholics who are engaged in going to church are exposed to. It's certainly true in the Episcopal Church in our baptismal covenant because either on behalf of the baby being baptized, for example, or an adult who takes takes those uh, vows, him or herself, we, we agree that each and every person is created in the image of God and that we have a responsibility to help one another, just as Jesus modeled throughout his ministry and mm. even reached out to people who were the so-called rejects of the time, the Samaritans, the Gentiles, and on and on. And the Torah teaching, his, his uh, deep Jewish spirituality came through in the Torah teaching of caring for the widow, the orphan, the stranger, and the poor. So from, from a religious perspective, there's that. There's, from a non-religious perspective, there's also the sense you know, in humanism to respect the value of every human being. And we're seeing, uh, in, in many fronts, we're seeing a complete denial of that. I mean, just yeah. go down to the southwest border and take a look around what we're doing down there. It's been horrendous. So... Uh, Inte and I think integrity also comes very much so from a place of prayer and meditation. I think if we don't take quiet time with our creator, it becomes very easy to get lost in all the noise that we're surrounded with in this culture. So that's, I think, the integrity piece. What was the second part of your question? Well, the second part of the question, and I'm and I'm fighting back because for everything that you say, I have another question. How do we okay. encourage and facilitate the greater involvement in civic engagement? And and you could say, you know, uh, resistance to oppression is you know second to that. How do we encourage and facilitate that when so many people are just struggling to get by? You know, the average American family, I think, is one paycheck away from being out in the street. How is that today with COVID? I can only imagine. It's even worse, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a really hard question. Uh, because for people who are working two and three jobs, even one job, uh, finding time to volunteer, well, you especially if you have children, little little ones especially, uh, is a pretty tall order. But there are also those of us who aren't necessarily in that situation. And I think that's part of what we are, that's where the disconnect is, is this, um, this idea that the people who suffer most are expected to facilitate these changes on their own, when in fact, we all need to be working alongside one another. And I'm not talking about uh, people who are more affluent, who have more or perhaps more educated or white, uh, you know, telling such folks what to do and how. 
I'm talking about our listening to them to, to find the issues we need to work on and work alongside them, with them, and stepping back when it's, you know, when we need to, uh, to provide a space for them to advocate for themselves. They're not helpless. They're just stemming a huge tide of privilege to which they are not a part. And so we have the influence and ability to help facilitate that. We should be teaching civil discourse in the schools. We should be teaching our children right now how to talk to each other about issues over which we disagree, but to do it in a civil and respectful way. This is essential to the generational approach to changing things. Why do you, why do you think it's not taught? I mean, I remember when I was in high school or was a junior high, we had a debate team mm -hmm. and I don't know how many schools have that anymore. I remember that we used to have electives, but I remember then when I beat, when I was an English teacher and was a substitute teacher in between all of these positions, you couldn't find a school that had electives anymore. Uh, you know, that's obviously another big piece of all of this and the economics of education and how yeah. kids get get more resources than others and we know we know that happens and we know the kids that get more typically are white and the kids who don't uh, are typically brown and black and i mean this is not a, a big secret but it's wrong yeah i mean we know it's wrong mm -hmm. they'll tell you it's wrong mm -hmm. but then it continues decade after decade so, I mean, what is the disconnect? The disconnect is, is we, uh, we are not dealing with racism like we need to. Slavery yeah. started in this country uh, ten, 10 generations before the Declaration of Independence in 1619. Yes. Slavery was with the United States since the inception of the country. So this idea that people of a darker skin color are inferior and in fact have been ruled to be, you know, less than human uh, has been with us a very, very long time. Now, the, the South lost the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments uh, dealt with all of that, but we didn't deal with the social reckoning that went on uh, in the Reconstruction era with systemic lynching and segregation and, and uh, disenfranchisement of black men for voting purposes and all of that stuff. Then you fast forward and yes, we've had the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, but generally speaking, white folks have not come to terms with how we live and how our privilege is in the DNA of this country. And that's what that's the hard work that we have that lie, lays ahead, you know, in our immediate future. What sort of lit that fuse, if you will, mm. was George Floyd. I mean, we'd had uh, Michael Brown and we'd had Freddie Gray and we we'd had these other uh, horrible situations occur. But that one became undeniable. I think it was largely because it was such a powerful photo that it was, you, it was you a couldn't video. deny it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can't, uh, you can look at something like that and you can turn away, but you'll never, ever be able to say again that you didn't see it and that you don't know about it. And right. that's, that's that space that we're in right now is we, we may be trying now to look away a little bit, although I do think uh the kitchen table discussion on racism has changed a great deal because of george floyd and some of the other incidents that have occurred brianna taylor and ahmad arbery and you know you can just go on and on um so so and i think that's really good uh but we're in that sort of liminal space where we've seen it we saw video it lasted eight minutes and 36 seconds and it, there's there's a part of us now that wants to turn away and go back to normal 
And so the question becomes is, are we gonna let that happen? Because in, in my view, we cannot. And I recommend, uh, Robin D'Angelo has a book out called White Fragility. Uh, who, and she talks about how yeah, white I've folks are very fragile about this. Mm. And uh, frankly, we just need to get over it. We need to read that book. We need to have conversations. We need to really do some soul searching. Harvard University has a wonderful implicit bias test that you can take on a number of issues like homophobia and gender and all kinds of things. And you can take your race implicit bias test and get a have sense you ever of seen where the, you are at. Have you ever seen Jane Elliott? Uh, yes, I think so. Really short lady with gray hair. I don't know how old she is. Uh, but if you Google Jane Elliott on YouTube or uh, what is it? Blue eye, brown eye. She was on Oprah. Okay. And she was conducting extremely powerful uh, workshops that would take people of different ages and bring them together and do a mock scenario in which people with brown eyes were told to sit in one section, people with blue eyes were told to sit in a different section, mm -hmm. and basically began illustrating what it would be like if the group with blue eyes were treated differently as inferior to the group with brown eyes. And in every instance where she did that workshop, it was extremely powerful where Obviously, the people with blue eyes would break down. They would become infuriated. They, you know, and so on. I, I'm doing it in injustice. I'm doing it in injustice. I'm doing her in injustice. Uh, but if you look, if you go to YouTube and type in Jane Elliott Oprah, you can see some of these workshops. And I, I saw her in some interview where she said that she had stopped doing it because recently she was beginning to get more and more death threats which was very new before she wasn't getting death threats. And now people had become so unhinged at the fact that she would do these workshops mm -hmm. that they were making death threats. But I don't but know if things all, are. That's all a function of white fragility. That's all. A absolutely. I can't, I can't handle this and I want you to shut up. And yeah. if you don't shut up, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to you. And that comes from a place of power where you can, yeah. you can say that, mm -hmm. that would, I mean, to me, that's like telling your employer, this is how I want to work. This is how much you will pay me. Uh, this is how you should talk to me and under what conditions mm -hmm. you, you can't do that, obviously, but societally that, um, dichotomy, that type of abusive relationship is very uh, institutionalized. Would you agree? Oh, there's no question about it. So, yeah, the question just is, what can we do about it as individuals? Mm -hmm. And then how do we put that into play into the larger society? Well, I, I'd like to address that, if that's okay. Sure, sure. Uh, you, you mentioned the spirituality of resistance. And so I, I just want to mention this uh, I, because I think it's so important. Um, the spirituality of resistance is about, it's a two-part thing. It's a, it's a two-pronged thing. And I say prongs because lawyers love prongs. That's how we assess whether something, you know, is passes muster, so to speak. Very so, logical. Yeah, it's it's logical. And so can you hear me OK? Absolutely. OK, I'm switching because for some reason my computer is telling me it's getting low on battery. So I want to uh -oh. plug it okay. back in. Um, so um, The Spirituality of Resistance is a, a book, too, and I'll give that to you in my uh, show notes by Roger okay. Gottlieb, who is a Jewish man and also a professor of philosophy. And he's uh, his major social interest is in environmental, the environmental crisis and uh, climate care, uh, creation care. 
but he wrote this book that has application to any major issue and it talks about how first of all we need to discern what is important to us privately through prayer through reading talking reflecting understanding ourselves and what drives us i also highly recommend and i'm writing about this that we get uh, if we don't have a myers-briggs assessment take the myers-briggs personality inventory learn more about yourself do an enneagram analysis find out what makes you tick what what is your threshold mm. for conflict there's all wow. kinds of inventories uh, out there that you can do to help you further understand what drives you yeah and once you know that and once you know what the issue is for you that you want to work on and for me it's immigration reform um i just feel really called to that after my ministry and then you take that information and you find a group with similar interests mm -hmm. and you join them we are, it's very human to need to belong somewhere and find a community organizing entity they don't have to it doesn't have to be faith-based necessarily if that's important to you maybe your congregation would be interested in starting to do some community organizing um, but you can go to other organizing entities like I am very active with Michigan United. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, got offices around our state. Uh, I work with them on immigration reform on a regular basis as a volunteer. And you can you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You see, you can find these groups that are working really hard on issues that are important to you and you can participate with them and you can get out there and make a difference and you will make a difference and you know, we don't all go ahead uh, i was just going to say i have to interject because so much of what you just said is basically and it's not to take away from what you're saying at all but a, a, almost everything you just said is marketing 101 is as well as finding your your spiritual and emotional uh foundation mm -hmm. because so case. yeah so much of that is marketing right in alter in, in the altruism business which is what i'm in um, yeah you know uh this work is very important to me i would do it whether i got paid or not but i do need to make a living but when you're doing business that is altruistic in its foundation in other words it's it's out there to help and make a positive difference in society uh, we call it outreach instead of marketing, mm -hmm. you know, but you're absolutely right. It's about getting the word out there and showing folks, you know, how and why and when and the what's of getting involved in issues that are really important to you. Most Americans, ac according to many polls, including relatively conservative Republicans, do not like what we are doing at the border. Mm hmm. And so this is an opportunity to find groups that are working to either make this go away or at least make it a lot better, uh, you know, living conditions and so forth. Uh, you can find places that are working on these issues and you can contribute your skills and talents and whatnot, which are unique. Uh, we all have, I'll, I'll use, um, if, if I may, I'll use a, a the concept that was uh, created by St. Paul in the, the first, his first letter to the Corinthians, he talks about how we are all one body in Christ and we are complementary members of the body of Christ. So some of us are good at evangelism and some of, us, some of us have gifts for teaching and some of us have gifts for exhortation or coaching, uh, but we all come together uh, to work mm. as one body and he it, Paul loves to ask a question and then answer it and he says so if the body were all I where would the hearing be um, you know and then he goes on to talk about how we are we all make up the heads hands feet heart whatever so this concept of the body of Christ, this coalition building, if you will, is one of the great keys to making major changes in our social justice. It's what Dr. King did. Um, 
it's what Cesar Chavez did, D Dolores Huerta. There, you know, I could go on and on, but and a lot of those big movements were made up by a lot of little things that were done by individuals. Right, so that are con connected it, and maintained. Exactly. It doesn't, yeah. you don't have to do something huge to make a difference. It's all the little things that add up to make the big thing. Yeah, and that's, uh, so I mean, you're basically saying, find your foundation of authenticity. Exactly. Identify outreach opportunities, and then mm -hmm. basically maintain that consistently and if you do that over six to 12 months you're going to start to see some kind of traction mm -hmm. as far as living the life you want to live manifesting some tangible results in your life mm -hmm. and yeah and it applies to so much that applies to just practical day-to-day -day things too. And I won't, mm -hmm. I won't get into marketing more, but the, yeah, it's, it's so reflective of that. Cause I hear that all the time from the flip side, why is my free do it yourself website not giving me the results that I want? And I'm like, because it's not, you're not equipping your life. You're, you're just not taking the approach that you, you should be taking. So let me stick to my list of questions for you and see if we can go on to the next one. Are you still with me? Okay, and we're back with part two of our interview with uh, Marsha Ledford. Uh, and you told me to call you Marsha, so I'm, I'm gonna do it. So let's start with my next question for you. What is political theology and how do we separate that if we need to from traditional church and then the media at large. Okay. So political theology or public theology, you'll hear it called both things, David. It's, um, you know, so don't worry about it. It's, I use political the theology because I think that it's a little bit more accurate in terms of what is involved so we take a faith-based message, and it, I'm not talking about a Christian message exclusively. I'm talking about any faith-based message, which could be from Hinduism or Jainism or Buddhism, uh, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, you know, or any, any others that I haven't mentioned, where you take that statement or you take that belief and you talk about it in the public square in a way that any member of the public could potentially listen to it. So it could be like on this podcast. Mm -hmm. It could be when you're testifying in front of a governmental committee. Maybe they're taking evidence on something and you have something important to say. And you, you feel... Uh, so, you know, in part driven by your faith perspective to talk about it. It could be at, in the halls of Congress, it could be at City Hall, it could be just down at the park. Uh, any place where the, the public has potential access uh, satisfies that part of the requirement. A faith-based message usually given to support social justice and uh, the other part of that prong, there's prongs here too. I've got prongs coming out of my ears. Um, there's, uh, uh, you try to reach as broad an audience as you can. So faith-based message, public square, as broad an audience as you can, as big an audience as you can. That's political theology. So how do you separate that from the traditional church and the media at, at, at large? I mean, you don't want it to with what you do on a given Sunday? I mean, do you want it to appeal to more people or do you yeah. want it to serve a, a more specific function? Right. Well, that's a good question. And as you know, uh, there are limitations that the IRS code puts on churches, uh, 501c3 entities in general. Right. But let's just talk about churches. 
So I can't endorse a candidate, one candidate from the pulpit on Sunday morning. I'm prohibited from doing that. Most of the limitations that we see on speech and action of churches revolve around an election cycle. Now, and, and that may also, we can speak on issues like hunger year round. Um, and if something rolls up about increasing SNAP benefits, uh, supplemental nutrition benefits, for yeah. example, we can still speak to that in an election cycle. But there are uh, tests that that measure, you know, how much of your activity, what percentage of your activity and your budget do you put towards advocating specifically for a re referendum, for example. Um, so we, in church, we are typically concerned with reaching our membership about our faith-based beliefs. And for the most part should not be attached to election, that speech. When you get set outside of the church and you're speaking to the general public, you know, the, then there are different rules that apply and it's complicated. We could have a whole show on this. And that's partly why I started Political Theology Matters as a for-profit company, because mm. I didn't want to have to worry about that. Now, if I'm called to guest preach on a Sunday in the church, all of that, uh, I'm not going to engage in the same kind of speech, political speech, that I would through Political Theology Matters because I'm a guest at a 501c3 entity and I'm not going to do anything that's going to put them in some sort of legal jeopardy. Does that make right. sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, let I want to extend that and say, what do you see as the realistic duty of Christians first? and then say progressive Christian secondly, mm -hmm. um, and the duty to be political theologians. How does this apply to other groups and should it, so that you're putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak? Yeah. Well, I think what I'm talking about applies to all Christians. Part part of the reason I have been making some distinctions between progressive Christians and say those folks who are members of the more conservative slash evangelical corners of Christ's Holy Vineyard is because our interpretation of the gospel is different. Now, I'm not going to say that uh, evangelical folks don't have the right to interpret scripture because I really do think they do, even though I may disagree with it strongly. So my audience for this, for what I'm doing, really is geared towards progressive Christians, Christians who uh, appreciate the talents and spiritual gifts of women and will therefore ordain them. Uh, people who understand that while all abortion has a, a tragic dimension to it, that we must be able to provide safe reproductive uh, procedures uh, for women. Right. And also uh, on the LGBT front, uh, that we too are created in the image of God and that God doesn't make junk and those kinds of things and that we should be able to get ordained like me or get married like me. Um, so my message is to strengthen how progressive Christians vocalize the gospel in the public square, because typically what happens is, is we're on the defensive. Progressive Christians, like most progressive people, are very hard to uh, um, center onto a single issue. Mm -hmm. Find a platform. Find a platform. We're typically very independent thinkers. We typically uh, have, you know, uh, we vary on how we feel on ver uh, at certain aspects of life. Um, and so it's like herding cats. That's a strength, but it's also a weakness because sometimes we need to come together and say, no, this is not what we believe. So Jesus said, feed my sheep. So what does that look like? What are we talking about there? Is it literally just 
you know, handing a hungry person a loaf of bread and a fish for a day? Is it about providing spiritual care? Is it about providing shelter? Is it about providing education and all the things that we as human beings need in order to survive and have a, a quality of life? Because that's what mm. I think it is. Well, yeah, I would tend to agree with you. And I think most people would say that they tend to agree with you. Yeah. But if we were to, I mean, if, if I were to look at 99, if I were to go to 100 churches, you know, how many of them are really going to be feeding the hungry and the needy without conditions mm -hmm. on a daily basis? I can't tell you how many times I've gone to homeless shelters and said, I have food, I have clothing, I want to donate. I couldn't find someone to donate to. Mm -hmm. I've been turned down where they said, we have too much, or we just don't want it, or we're not interested, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it always struck me as a disconnect that, you, you know, that you're trying to walk right, but talk left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's tricky. Uh, I have I have found typically in more progressive circles that uh, th there is good response to saying, look, we need to gather stuff up for children who came over the border alone and they have absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. I was involved in a, you know, a drive for clothing and toiletries and all sorts of little things like that. I have a distinct memory of that. You know, I made a, a a request through a congregation and the next week we were uh, we were snowed under with stuff uh so it depends on who you're talking to and what their ideology is if you yeah. really believe that you know america's great and you can survive if you work your keister off um and you should not get social help social services or whatnot you ought to be able to do it yourself then you're going to be less inclined to participate in this kind of charitable work. Your ideology is going to drive what your motivations are. Mm. What do you, I mean, what do you think promulgates or perpetuates that worldview that, you know, is pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, mm -hmm. um, you know, the tough talk, uh, John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, but, but also it's also a lot of fear of the other. Oh yes. Usually the dark skinned person is going to come get you the boogeyman or, or take what you have. Right. Um, when, you know, what perpetuates that? Because I see that, uh, if I watch, I mean, I don't want to get too into politics, but I see it in the media and it certainly is perpetuated in political um, rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And maybe half the country, maybe a little bit less, I don't know. But what perpetuates that? What keeps it alive? Well, uh, this is my this is my view of things. Um, we have a dichotomy in Christianity that falls down along say uh the value of every human being which is gospel driven and then rules and regulations which come more out of the epistles romans and first and second corinthians and thessalonians and galatians and all so there's there's like the the rules of the road and then there's the gospel and America was founded on this premise of uh, free white men, limited government, and maintaining or controlling the moral compass. And through the centuries, through the decades and centuries, you can still see it. It's still very much alive. It's alive mm -hmm. right now. And so um, this this became a very individualized kind of a freedom versus the body of Christ of the gospel. And I, th I think that's the primary difference. The United States has been an overwhelmingly Protestant country since well before its inception. And so this idea of private piety, of freedom, of saying, having the right to determine what is right and wrong, all of these things have lived within white 
Protestantism and now especially evangelical Protestantism for centuries. And it has control of us. And it has, that's partly why the Trump phenomenon has been so strong. Mm -hmm. Because if we move, as we move towards a more um, diverse population, for example, in 2050, David, in 2050, one mm -hmm. in three persons in the United States will have Hispanic heritage. And so there's this sort of, if you will, uh, it's not a great way to put it, but you'll see what I mean. So this browning of America is making the white, independent, free, controlling population of the United States just freak out. It's freaking out. Yeah, it, it surprised me that when when Trump was a candidate and he came out and, you know, with the, the, the video leaked where he said, you know, I grab women by their private areas. And I remember seeing that and uh -huh. thinking, if you're a fundamentalist or if you just consider yourself a moral person, how can you hear that and say, oh, yeah, this is the guy for me? But it seemed like the more that came out, the more excited and uh, inflamed those followers became. Mm -hmm. So much so that when he ran for re-election recently, more people came out to endorse him than had come out before. Mm -hmm. And the Hispanic <laughs> vote for him was greater than it was before. I couldn't believe that. I'm like, why would yeah, you vote for someone who refers to you in all these disparaging ways? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that latter part, but it goes back to that other thing. You know, you can see something and you can look away, but you can't deny that you saw it. And what I have... I have sensed that fundamental fundamentalists and evangelicals of a, a certain ideology are willing to look away at the uh, character flaws of, of this person because he represents, you know, that make America great again. Well, what does that mean? What what is this this lens of nostalgia that has a tendency to cleanse the wrongs that went on in that particular period? Mm. What are we talking about here? How far are we going back? Because I think we're going back to slavery. It's it's you know? also I think it also speaks to what you mentioned with the white fragility and the 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 yeah. need to feel empower. Mm -hmm but also empowered right. where we get to tell you what you can do, what you can't do, exactly. what you can look at, how long you can look at it and everything else. We want to be able to dictate that. And we like a leader who um, is encouraging that. So mm -hmm. if, if you bully people, if you belittle people, you insult other countries, mm -hmm. well, we love that. Yeah. Because that makes us feel that we're number one. Right. We want to feel like we're number again, number one again in a way when white hegemony was unquestioned. And he has become, Trump has become for them, a white messiah. He's, you know, he's the deliverer of white privilege. And he's protecting them against losing the insulation yeah. of, of that white privilege. That's the bottom line. And, you know, and that's partly why white women are not necessarily offended by the horrible things that he says about women, because they're still white. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have experienced discrimination based on gender, but my whiteness generally helps me more than the discrimination I suffer as a woman. Now, you know, and I and my education, which they're all you know, they're all linked. They're all axes of privilege. And mm. for the most part, I operate, my primary axis of privilege is being white. Yeah. Yeah. Let me switch gears for a minute and then we can go back to that um, topic uh, loosely. Where do you stand on the First Amendment and the separation 
of church and state. Okay. And then I'll go into part two of that question. How's that? Okay. Well, the First Amendment, when it was enacted in 1791, was like nothing the world had ever seen before. Speaking about out against your country, uh, against the king or the president or whatever it was, was a really new thing. In England, if you slandered the, the crown, you could get your tongue cut out. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it, it was, there, it's only 45 words long, and it's really one of the most astonishing little paragraphs the world will ever see, probably, because it was so novel. And the thing that it does is it prohibits the Congress from doing certain things. It doesn't prohibit us as individual citizens, and I think that's where the big confusion occurs. We've taken the limitation that was put on Congress and we've conflated it as a limitation on what we can do and say. And that's important to remember. Um, there are, there's one prohibition, the establishment of a superior religion by Congress. And then there are five rights that are enumerated. The right to free exercise of religion, the right to speech, to press, to assembly and the right to petition the government for the redress of grievances. So the First Amendment does not contain the phrase separation of church and state. A lot, I talk to people and they think it's in the Constitution. And it's not. It was an interpretation of the First Amendment by Thomas Jefferson. I do think it's important that we maintain uh, uh, you know, not having uh, an established religion. I think that's essential because whenever you establish something and uh, groups are not a part of it, then you get into exclusivity. And when exclusivity happens, then people get discriminated against. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to say something a little confusing, uh, but you'll, I think you'll understand where I'm coming from when I say we have been a Protestant, Christian Protestant theocracy since the inception of this country. Mm -hmm. We have become increasingly pluralistic, meaning many other faith traditions, non-Christian traditions are practiced in the United States and we respect those. And as time goes on, uh, pluralism will continue to be more respected, in my opinion. That's okay. not what evangelicals want, but that's the path we're on and it, I think it's the right path but uh, we can speak our faith in the public square even though people think it may violate some separation of church and state stuff the separation of church and state is an ideal it is not uh, you know constitutionally mandated so so for the first part of this the first amendment really actually provides us with the kind of protection that the world had not seen before. And in fact, Jesus did not have the First Amendment. And you see where that um, got it. Do you, yeah, I, I mean, I, my, I'm, my mind is going in all kinds of different directions as far <laughs> as the First Amendment. I mean, how far is too far where you see, you know, something like Fox News where they know, they must know, that they're peddling falsehoods. Mm -hmm. I saw on the news today where, what was it? I forget the lawyer's name who was saying that the election was a conspiracy Sydney and it was rigged. Powell. And in the news, her defense, and obviously I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I believe her defense was something along the lines of, I didn't do anything wrong because any reasonable person would have, you know, the capability of thought and known that this was, you know, not, not true. Well, personally, as a that's, defense, that's the first amendment. Yes. Well, yes and no. I mean, we do not allow for absolute free speech. There have, we have limitations on speech. We have time, place, and manner restrictions that have been upheld by the courts. 
uh, we, you know, we have areas of speech that we we do not allow. Defamation is, in a way, a form of limiting speech, although it's right. not necessarily state action. The first test is always state action. You know, um, if if the state is involved, then the stakes get very very high. But when uh, individuals are engaging in speech, we do put prohibitions from time to time. You can't yell fire in a theater. It's too, right. it, it's too dangerous uh, for, the, for the ramifications of doing something like that. So I think her defense is idiotic. I'll, I'll just put it out there. Okay. So yeah. if, you're, if you're saying that kind of stuff where the reasonably prudent person should know that it's a bunch of bunk, then why say it in the first place? That's not what she was trying to do. She was trying yeah. to persuade people that the election was fixed. So let's just own it and put it out there. And then, you know, is that protected speech? I, um, I have mixed feelings. I was delighted when Trump was barred from Twitter. And that's because Twitter is a... And he was being held responsible for the nonsense that was coming out of his Twitter feed. I think that accountability is a part and parcel of speech. You know, you can say what you believe, but there may be ramifications. Right. Uh, of and, course. Yeah. And so, you know, to say, well, you know, I, I said this stupid stuff, but, you know, if people, it basically, if people did believe me, then they're stupid too. Well, I'm sorry. I, that just doesn't work for me particularly when you're talking about a member of the bar who is an officer of the court, who is supposed to, you know, strive to be honest in dealings and to avoid the appearance of impropriety. That's an important part of our oath when we are sworn in as attorneys to protect the Constitution and to, you know, we're supposed to avoid the appearance of impropriety. And she was not doing that, in my opinion, at all. Well, yeah, in my view, I would... I would concur with that just on the basis of simple logic and, and yeah. just simple ethics. It just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and I mean, also, you know, from a, a, a spiritual and practical level, too, I would say the whole law of cause and effect that if you put out falsehoods, it's going to negatively influence and impact people. If you call uh, by extension, let's say if you call COVID-19, the China virus, the Wuhan virus, or the Kung flu, and you say yes. this over and over again yes. on a very public form on a daily basis, mm -hmm. don't be surprised when you have a rise in uh, hate crimes against pe yes. people of, of, of Asian descent, as we're seeing now, which is, again, it's like, well, these are these are people who live in America, yeah. lived here their whole lives. They're not in China. They may not even have been in, been they born there. Be right. You're assuming that. Yeah. Right. And even if they were, they didn't create mm -hmm. the virus. They're not in right. the Chinese government. So what do they have to do with it? You're reacting emotionally and illogically. But let me uh, switch gears so I stick to my questions and go back to what we were talking about previously uh, as well. What do you feel is the legacy of discrimination, institutionalized discrimination, slavery? How do you see that as manifesting itself? And what can our society do to try to turn back that systemic institutionalized, you know, system that we see on display so we don't keep seeing these same you know, very depressing news stories other than just activism. Well, uh, activism, activist movements are typically how we have, uh, you know, changed institutionalized exclusivity in, in the United States. And so right. we look at the suffrage movement of women voters, women trying to get the right to vote. We look at the Civil Rights Act, which was trying to reinvigorate the 13th and 14th Amendment, 15th Amendments, uh, 100 years after their passage in the uh, 64 and 65. 
the LGBT movement and now having won the constitutional right to marry. We generally, uh, and um, the rights of migrant workers under Cesar Chavez uh, and that whole movement, which uh, the Farm Workers uh, um, Association, Farm Workers Union, we generally in the United States achieve a higher degree of equality in stages, in layers, mm -hmm. if you will, where a certain group is in some way emancipated, uh, depending on the circumstances. And I think that's generally the way things will be for a time. Um, maybe 50 years from now, we would be to a point where we can say, hey, this is wrong, let's make a law and fix it. And we don't have to go through the enormous machinations that we go through now. Yeah, But I think activism is key. I think community organizing is key to changing things for the better. I've always wondered uh, from a global perspective, does what the U.S. experience or what we see in the U.S. on a day to day basis as far as uh, institutionalized systemic racism, discrimination, and also violence, you know, with these, these, these brutal shootings and everything. How do we compare to other countries and other nations? Is, I mean, are we out, outliers? Uh, you know, I've always wondered that because I haven't been to other countries. I don't know what it's like in Spain and Italy and the UK and so on. The United States, because of the way that we formed, the, the way that we came to the East Coast and just moved westward until we hit the Pacific Ocean, is, I think, probably unique. If not unique, there are not very many other countries that have had that kind of a, a beginning. And in order to do that, we had to basically decimate Native American per peoples. Um, we had to fight and guns have always been a part of our ethos, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, we won the West with guns and lots of migration and just basically overrunning indigenous persons. Part of the reason that the Second Amendment is such a big deal is because of that and the sense of manifest destiny that white people were put here by God to settle this savage land and all of that stuff. So we had we partly some of us, not all of us, but met, many of us identify ourselves as being able to defend ourselves through the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. And this goes very much hand in hand with that independent, free, uh, limited government, control the moral compass, do whatever the heck I want sort of a person. Uh, th these are all intertwined, which is why the NRA and other groups are having such a fit over limiting the use of semi-automatic weapons. Um, I think personally, we must look like idiots to other folks around the world with these one shooting after another after another including a school full of children yeah um what is the matter with us but i think it's all so tied in that history of freedom and limited government and being able you know having that attitude i know what's right and wrong and i'm going to make that decision for mm. you and it's just perpetuates itself yeah, it really hasn't been going very well. Um, I'll leave it at that. Let me ask you, um, what is American civil religion? Okay, so that ties into what I was just talking about with the uh, free white man and limited government and moral compass control. American civil religion uh, exists today. And it starts, there are three prongs okay. uh the the, the first that's okay one, i like prongs okay so and we'll we'll contrast it with political theology so help me remember to do that so american civil religion involves taking a concept that is not necessarily and probably not scripturally based and making it sacred 
Okay. okay. The second prong is developing some sort of a creed that is associated with the first thing. And then the third thing is, uh, a, you know, making everybody assent to it, expecting or demanding or, you know, questioning why you don't accept it as unpatriotic um, is that third part. So let's use an example. The first one would be white privilege. So white privilege does not come out of the Bible. Nobody in the Bible was white. Okay. It's highly so, unlikely because of where they were geographically. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so there's this idea that being white is the best thing you could possibly be. And it makes you superior to everybody that isn't white. It always okay. used to blow my mind that people would feel that way when the Bible said Jesus had hair like wool and feet the color burnt brass. Mm -hmm. I've never seen yes. a white guy with hair like wool, even right. a, a Jewish guy with the Jufro. It's like, I, you know, I've never seen the hair like wool or feet right. the color burnt brass, which is pretty dark. Yep. Yep. So uh, sorry to interject that. that. Was, no, that's okay. It reminds me of that episode of All in the Family when Archie is drunk and he goes to the basement to talk to the furnace guy that he thinks for some reason is God. And mm -hmm. when he gets down there, the guy's black and, you know, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, but anyway, um, so we have um, white privilege as mm -hmm. sacralized. It's become sacred, like it did come from the Bible. Then we have a creed. What do you think the creed has been the last four years? Manifest destiny. Not manifest destiny, but very close. I mean, it's the same. It comes on a red hat. Make oh, yeah. Right again. Yes, yes. Which was taken it, from Reagan, I think. Uh, as a you know, I don't know, but I had never heard that. But um, it takes that white privilege um, and it it says, let's hearken to back to when whites really were in charge. Yeah. And then the third thing is, you know, if you don't agree with this, then you're unpatriotic and you don't get it and you should be struck off the citizenship rolls or something like that. Okay. So that's American civil religion and it's very much in play right now. And it's what we saw on January 6th. Plus there was this weird interweaving of, you know, Jesus saves and all of that kind of stuff that, you know, um, it was very upset upsetting for me. Um, and then political theology is different. It takes a faith-based premise, like love your neighbor, mm. and uh, tries to weave that into the public discourse. In other words, it doesn't want to overtake the conversation, but it wants to be part of it, which is what a democracy is. That's when various voices come together and have a conversation and to quote john stuart mill in open debate do you arrive at the truth so the the approach is very different one is very controlling and very manipulative and the other is uh trying to put forth uh, a conscientious faith position as a conversation to influence policy and lawmaking mm. Okay. Well, I've only got about five more questions for you. Okay. So let me ask you to take what you just said a little bit further and kind of take these in steps here. What do you see as white nationalism and where does that stand against the First Amendment in opposition to movements such as Black Lives Matter and the attempts whether knowingly or not, with programs that denigrate it, like uh, Blue Lives Matter. I've never seen a blue man or a blue person. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a uniform, obviously, that you put on and can take off, whereas Black Lives Matter, they can't, you can't peel your skin off. And it's a saying, my life matters. But then you have Blue Lives Matter saying, well, 
Yeah, but ours does too. And it's almost like, an, is it an intentional denigration? But let me let you answer the question. Uh, I think that white nationalists have a right to speak under the First Amendment. I don't like what they say. Uh, I could go so far as to say I hate what most most what they say, or I dislike it. Just as I have a right to do the same thing. Where the rubber hits the road when the first bottle breaks or the first rock gets thrown or any of that kind of stuff. When when people lose control, particularly at a protest where a mob mentality can break out, then we move into a different place. And I'm speaking really on both sides of the fence. Um, mm -hmm. I do not like to see Black Lives Matter protests, uh, Black Lives Matter protests devolve into you know, a riot any more than I like to see it on the other side. So I, I would say pr primarily that's the thing. Now, at, you can say whatever you want, but there should always be accountability. There should be ramifications when damage is caused. Right, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's pretty common sense. It's stuff you learn in kindergarten. It's not that hard. But, you know, there's violence that's manifested physically. But then there's violence that's manifested uh, spiritually and emotionally and intellectually. But I guess that goes back to the freedom of expression and the First Amendment, because I could argue and just say, mm -hmm. well, when the yep. white nationalist gets up there and preaches hatred, fear, division, you're mm -hmm. basically you're basically putting forth violence against people emotionally, intellectually, mm -hmm. you're doing damage to people who are receptive to that. Whereas people like Black Lives Matter, they're not doing damage to anyone emotionally or psychologically. They're just saying we want to be recognized. Well, white, white nationalists would dif disagree with you. But well, it hurts us, yeah, because we don't yeah, agree. Because they want to disempower people of color. That's exactly yeah. what they want to do. Um, yes, they're saying hurtful, terrible things. But we empower them when we take them seriously. And I don't mean like, you know, they, they don't, they're not capable of being violent. What I'm saying is in, instead of, you know, getting all upset by what they're saying, I think the better response is, to do counter messaging and to talk about what you believe and what you think is right, right. and uh to try and deflate that by not giving it more credence you know not dignifying it with a response so to speak so not um, giving the flame oxygen exactly and, and exactly. saying okay look they had their uh you know their uh, opportunity to voice their opinion we don't acknowledge it. We don't criticize it. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to give voice to our view points and uh, really try to do it better, more right. more resoundingly, more emo with, with with more resonance, maybe. So let me just ask you a few more questions. So let's say for the sake of example, you go to a protest uh, yeah. event. What's the best way to follow up on that so that you actually see it? Is it to the continued involvement? That's a given. Uh, what would you add to that other than, you know, what we said before about, you know, outreach? Is it just, you know, being organized, deliberately organized and saying, I'm going to go to a protest movement. I'm not going to expect that to be the be all end all. I'm, I'm going to do more. Right. I, I think protests typically are the, can be the thing that lights the, ignites the flame of uh, full resistance and success in making changes. Mm. In other words, you're not just going to typically create an avenue of social change by engaging in a protest. Although I think they are very important when they're, you know, when they're done well. I think yeah. we need to be more creative about our protests. Uh, for example, you know, uh, if we are protesting a cut 
of federal funds for SNAP for supplemental nutrition uh, uh, money. You know, why not have go to uh, the representative's office or the senator's office in our state and having a holy Eucharist and ringing the building by having a sacred meal. Uh, there, there's many ways of doing messaging than just standing and yelling with placards. And believe me, I've done plenty of that. And there is a part of me that needs to do that and be vocal and get out there. Um, and uh, I've attended uh, anti-deportation protests, you know, for example, and I give a micro homily on Jesus and the Holy Family as refugees in Egypt. They had to go to Egypt or Herod was going to have Jesus killed mm -hmm. as a baby. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do that very upfront part of uh, activism. But then in addition to that, we need to have the, the behind the behind the scenes stuff where we are lobbying our elected officials and we are doing write letter writing campaigns and phone banking and um, all of those kinds of things. That's partly why Michigan went blue in this last election. In Southeast Michigan alone, 250,000 doors were knocked on by 501c4 ent entities who can talk about uh, political candidates. It wasn't some fluke or a cheat or Dominion voting systems, you know, not working right. It's because people spent two years working on it. Mm -hmm. You know, so there has to be the front end, but there and the, the back end of it. And that's what makes it really effective. Well, I only have one last question for you to put a bow on it, as they say. Uh, if people out there are hurting or in need of support uh, mm -hmm. or want to reach out to you, Sure. Or want to get in touch. A, what is appropriate and how can they get in touch to either seek help or maybe donate or say, hey, I want to get involved. Sure. Right. Well, first of all, you can go to my website at politicaltheologymatters.com. There's lots of resources there. Uh, all this will be in the show notes. I'll send this to David. You can um, check out the the videos that I have available to learn more about political theology. If you want, if you're a Christian and you want to learn more about Moses and Jesus as public theologians, you can find videos about that stuff there. Um, if you click on the homepage to political theology matters, I've got a free download right now that has uh, six easy ways to engage in political theology right now. Of course, you can email me at Marsha M-A-R-C-I-A at myptm, M-I-P-T-M dot com. And that'll be in the show notes. And uh, we'll have a conversation. I'd be delighted to do that. You can read about seminars and other speaking engagement opportunities that are available to you and your group. Um, so I welcome hearing from you. I'd love to uh, I'd love to hear more about what it is that would help you be a political theo theologian. And of course, my book will be out later in the year, and I'll let David know when that happens. Well, Marcia, thank you so much for your time and for your insights. Um, and for anyone watching or listening, thank you for your time. If you found this episode to be informative or helpful in any way, please consider uh, liking it and subscribing every little bit helps and uh, also attracts more attention to the podcast as we move forward so thank you so much everybody and thank you again marcia please awesome. stick around so please stick pleasure. around absolutely so much, David. And okay. blessings on you and your listening audience thank you so much Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue 
slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode. Okay, let me pause here for one minute.